And we are live. Uh, you're welcome to another beautiful session on the Teachers on EdTech Network uh, conference, 24 hour online global conference for uh, educators and education stakeholders. Currently, we have Mr. Paul Langat. Mr. Paul Langat is a Kenyan and he's an educator and he's ready to give a powerful presentation about policy. Uh, policy is a very important thing right now and uh, you can't do away with it. And it's very, very important in whatever you want to do in uh, getting to remote distance, online learning, or whatever option you're considering. So Mr. Langa is gonna be talk talking to us about that very much. Hello, Mr. Langa, you're welcome. Uh, thank you very much, John. Yeah, exactly. So you're welcome. We really appreciate you for doing this presentation. So can you do something? I, uh, I think I've told you, maybe let your, uh, your presentation be in full screen mode. So that means you'll have to, is that you click, you click F5 on your system or you look for where you can put it to full screen so that you okay. can, yeah. Okay, exactly. John. okay, John, is it full screen now? Uh, let me wait for it. Um, um, I'm waiting to see if it's going to go full screen. It's not full screen yet. Not yet? Yeah, not yet. But, 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 but the, 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 there's no problem. The only thing is that I wanted it to be that you'll be able to, uh, the viewers will be able to see the full slate. Yeah, so um, try to look at the menu on top. Uh, you see where the slideshow is, and then you can click slideshow. And how, how is it now? Uh, it's still the same. It's supposed to show like uh, it's, it's supposed to cover your screen when you click slideshow. Okay, on my end, uh, it is it is full. It is fuller. It is uh, it is on okay. slideshow mode on my end. Okay. Okay. Let uh, let let's see what what goes on. So. You can start your presentation. Thank you, Mr. Langa. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, John, for your introduction. Um, welcome, members, for my uh, presentation on uh, rethinking educational policies during this period of um, the, the pandemic, uh, which has been brought about by COVID-19. Um, to begin with, um, Policy frameworks are very important because they set the, the agenda for any activity to be done either by individuals, organizations, or governments. So in this respect, um, the pandemic has uh, gotten most of the countries across the globe um, off guard um, because the policies we had set aside before were based on what existed when they were being done. So at the moment, most countries are having an issue with um, tackling most of the items um, in their agenda uh, because of, of the policy frameworks which are not uh, conforming to the current new normal. Now, um, this pandemic has hit most governments and uh, most um, institutions' ways of life in a way that uh, the original normal has been destabilized and everybody is on the run to look at the new normal how they can be able to sue to fit in the new normal so in the education sector um it has been badly hit by this uh pandemic why am are we saying so because the sector has the largest majority of uh, people it also um carries the majority of resources across countries and uh, the people we are talking about here are um, the, the, the students the support staff and even the teachers so if you look at the population of the world uh, about two-thirds are in some sort of training somewhere either as preschool primary schools high schools tertiary schools uh, and, and, and even um, 
workshops like these ones we are we are having uh, today. So um, this uh, kind of uh, this pandemic has really affected the, the the sector. This sector again is very important because education feeds all the other sectors with the skills which are uh, required to drive the rest of the economy in any given uh, country or institution. Now, um, let's look at what we had before the pandemic. What were the policy frameworks before the pandemic? So um, they were characterized by face-to-face -face learning in classrooms. And in most cases, most of the classrooms were fully packed. Um, then we had also lecture halls. In some cases, uh, some lecture halls could hold up to around 1,000 people, squeezed in a available four by four um, space. Sharing of tools, especially uh, in the TVET sector, where we have uh, the, 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 the tools um, which, which are being shared by all the, the, the students. Uh, in the computer labs, because of inequalities of resources, all students in a given school or college share the same number of computer uh, facilities. Then examinations um, was being uh, marked physically. So there was a physical uh, uh, scripting of the exam and um, a manual uh, marking of that particular exam. In some areas also, um, we had uh, colleges, college hostels, where students are uh, used to put up. And in some areas, um, college transport. Now, what has, what has come wrong? What, what's now wrong with this? When the pandemic came, everything came to a stop as uh, per the old um, policy framework. Because we can no longer go back to school and be able to have because of social distancing issues. So when you're not talk about social distancing, um, in the new normal, it's a very big challenge to us because the facilities we have cannot be expanded to meet the ever increasing number of users of those facilities. So if we distance, then maybe a, a third of, of the spaces we have will become learning areas so that we can be able to achieve the social distancing. Then the common user learning and instructional materials cannot be used again, or if they are used, then we need to have a lot of resources to ensure that they are sanitized over and over. Um, we have had students who have been learning in overseas countries. Most of them have been locked up in those other countries. They cannot come back home. They cannot learn. There are those who are prepared to leave for other countries to take up their, 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 their learning. They cannot because of uh, the restrictions which have been brought about by the pandemic. Then the written examinations, uh, which has become part of life of most of the um, education world, are now at an abeyance. So what do we need to look at? The critical effects of the COVID-19 pandemics on education is as follows. It has brought the sector to a near collapse uh, because as of today, um, no schools are on. And uh, for those countries which have tried to take their uh, students to class, to class, have had to return them to their homes because of the spikes of the, 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 uh, the, the, the pandemic. Then most of the schools in some areas have been used as uh, um, isolation centers. So it also causes up some traumatic effects on the students and, and the other people. The same traumatic effects also are affecting children who are just idle at homes. And uh, it's also a very bad uh, effect uh, caused by the pandemic. Then the other thing which uh, has come up is redundancies on transition. All over the world, a year has been lost. A year. Losing a one year in learning is a very big loss. So what is the effect of this? There is um, a problem on the transition because we have the ongoing students who need to transit to the next level. 
and then the incoming ones. So if the if the ones who are there cannot be able to transit, the um, those who are who are supposed to join cannot join, and it causes a, a very huge redundancy along the chain. Then uh, in some countries, especially in Africa, we have had issues of uh, early pregnancies, drug abuse, and physical trauma, uh, which has affected uh, the students who are supposed to be in school. So because of the idleness they are they are facing at home. Uh, most of them have uh, had uh, unfortunate uh, cases of uh, early pregnancies, uh, drug abuse, and uh, physical trauma. In some cases, we have had uh, school children or students in general engaging in criminal and other, other antisocial activities. Um, countries around the, across the world are now um, pondering on how to um, bring education back um, to, on course. However, it, it has brought about um, large budgetary provisions so that we have enough spaces, we have more learning hours. Um, now, if you have to have more, more, more learning hours, it means we have more tutors, again, which is also enlarging the budgets. Then uh, another effect has been uncertainty on continuity of education. Because those countries which try to open up uh, the education sites had to close them immediately because of the spike of the disease. So in the near future, we are seeing uh, uncertainty on continuity of education. And then um, the, the biggest problem is, is uh, the fear of contagion. Even if everything has been done, the fear of contagion still remains. And this is going to affect education in a very big way. So way forward, um, how can we come out of this uh, debacle? In order to circumvent this debacle and put education on course, then we should be able to review our existing policy frameworks. And these reviews should also not be done in isolation, but in a, in a global manner, because education cuts across um, communities and cultures and countries continents. So we have to have a concerted effort to ensure that we have a global uh, approach to the review of education policies. So we begin at the local education levels. What should be put in place? Then overseas education and a common technology, which uh, is going to ensure that we remain on course in education. Uh, when pondering uh, about uh, doing the policy, the new policy framework for the new normal, there are some key questions which need not to escape our minds. The first uh, question is um, on the institutionalization of virtual training. Um, very few countries across the globe have become conversant and have uh, appreciated the use of virtual learning. Now. Because people cannot go uh, to those overseas countries from their country, how can we be able to link virtual training now to take place at uh, the place of uh, overseas um, training? The practical sessions in schools in Tibet sector, for example, need to be addressed. Should we buy more equipment to, for every other uh, trainer or trainee? Or should we get other ways of ensuring that these trainees get the same same skills uh, without actually um, uh, taking their lives, risking their lives uh, in the, the, the sharing uh, aspect? The next question is, how can we be able to uh, generally assess the learners? Because now taking the, the, the scripts uh, for marking by the tutors and then just their lives. Because if a student um, had some, um, the, this virus, for example, and uh, they, they have the scripts being uh, marked by those tutors, the tutor and their families also risk getting the infection. So how can we be able to ensure that we look at um, the new assessment in the new normal? 
the hostels where um, students used to live. How can we ensure that in those hostels we have um, a bare minimum of social distancing, or should we be able to do away with hostels all altogether? Now, if hostels are done away with, how will these learners be able to meet the education? Then uh, so social distancing in schools um, also she is, is, is another problem because of the numbers. How can we be able to, to address that? Then the next question we need to look at is um, distance learning uh, in most countries has not been looked at as a very good way of learning. And um, people um, still have the old mentality of having a one-on-one -on -one in a particular environment. So how can we be able now to engender distance learning um, to replace overseas training so that we can still get the same skills, the same competencies, but this time around not be being able to move away from home? The next question also we need to look at is how do the developed countries leverage on technology, technology, technology to access overseas training? So in most developing countries, technology has not been uh, fully developed. So the question now we need to look at in the new policy framework should be, how can we now leverage on technology so that we can now be able to have virtual classes. We become, we are, we are in overseas classes while in our homes. Um, the next question also is about the health and safety of students, learners, and by extension the tutors because they come from different homes and uh, if in case one of them in a community of students in a learning environment uh, is infected the chances of cross infection is very high how can we take care of that the responsibility of a training institution in case uh, a learner or a tutor gets infected while in school how can that be taken care of who will be responsible Budget lines to address now the new requirements. How can we be able to push the agenda in the new policy framework to ensure that governments put in more money to the education sector so that we can be able now to at least move education on? In conclusion, um, a robust policy framework needs to be contemplated, designed, so that we can be able to go back to class as soon as today. Because in education, if you lose a day, a week, a month, and so on, it's a very huge loss to the whole ecology of learning. Um, we also need to um, invest on technology so that um, the new normal, that is what the normal requires. So how can we be able to address that? Now, as um, we finish, I'm calling upon the delegates of people who are hearing uh, this kind of presentation to consider um investing in the new normal in developing countries especially africa through supply of ed education technology which include hardware software and uh, technical support thank you very much for listening Hello, Mr. Langa. Yes. Yeah, so um, I was in the background listening to your presentation. Yeah. <clears throat> and um, you, you actually posed the questions that, um, because your slide was actually not moving, so I have to be uh, clear about, about we, it's, it was the audio that we followed all oh. through. Yeah, so. But that's not a problem. You did a great job of talking to <clears throat> the, the slide. So we really appreciate that. Now, okay, okay, okay. Now, you said routine education policies amid COVID pandemic. Now, is it, uh, is it a must that we should think in terms of COVID only or the fact that education based on disruptions, either COVID or technology, requires that we change the system to which we run things. What do you think? 
Thank you very much, uh, John. Um, we are going to use the COVID-19 pandemic as a, as a benchmark for dealing with a policy framework to deal with any disruption. Because I think the worst we have seen now in in form of, uh, as a serious form of this dist uh, disruption was COVID-19. So we are going to use the COVID-19 lessons learned from here to ensure that future disruptions are taken care of. Okay, okay. Now, um, I'll ask, also ask for that because now I'm checking the comment. I think um, uh, Karen is actually saying something about uh, what you told in terms of the lost um, class in education because of the COVID pandemic. Now, you're based in Kenya, right, Mr. Langat? Yeah. So now, what, what do you think is the percentage of people that, okay, from your rough estimate, is the percentage of people that were totally cut off from learning during the COVID uh, situation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it depends from uh, from from uh, place to place, but in African in African uh, African countries, um, most of the schools are not on as of today, and um, so we can be able to say, by a very big extent, learning has been disrupted. Now, uh, I, I, and I think I'm going to never mind. I'm going to take you up on that because. Uh, the uh, the essence of learning and going to school uh, have been several times been debated seriously. Yeah. Uh, several people say that, yeah, uh, learning could take place anywhere, anytime. And, you know, you were talking about the fact that people going to schools overseas right from their, uh, the comfort of their homes. Now, the, the question is this, how much uh, is the education system, perhaps in Kenya as a case study, how much is the education system in Kenya, how much has it uh, grown to be able to cater for uh, learning to be continual in diverse cases? I'll give you uh, uh, an example of what I'm talking about. I hope you've heard of OERs before, Open Educational Resources. Mr. Langer. Yeah. Yep. yeah. And I hope you've heard of massive open online courses as well, MOOCs. Yeah. Now, these are uh, concepts and these are creations that are now making people to uh, take learning up from anywhere as long as they are ready to learn. So now, if pupils are out of school and uh, necessarily, you know, this is a general question. We are, we are you know, considering all of these things. So if pupils are out of school, should they uh, necessarily be out of learning when there are opportunities that they can still use to learn outside the school or uh, uh, confines? Okay, thank you very much, John. Yeah, yeah um, the, the, the opportunities are out there, but what is lacking is the accessibility to that particular technology, which can be able to take the place of a one-on-one -on -one, a classroom situation. Now, uh, you, you, have, you have talked about a very, very important point and area, accessibility. Now, um, I, I think we can go further and talk about uh, accessibility. Um, what do you think, uh, now two questions. What are currently, if you have studied the education policy in Kenya, what are the provisions of, for accessibility in terms of, you know, there, there's uh, accessibility in terms of those that are uh, uh, the special students, and there's also accessibility in terms of not having the required resources uh, quite well for you to be able to be uh, in, in, in the form of learning. So 
what are the indicators that you see in uh, the Kenyan education policy? Or on the other side, what do you think needs to be done to make learning education accessible through the policies that you're talking about? Okay, thank you very much, John. I think what we need to do is uh, to ensure that uh, the policy framework uh, should be able to ensure that one, we make technology accessible to everybody. So that each particular part of, of uh, for example, Africa, each particular part of Africa can be reached uh, on, on uh, any technological platform. And then number two is to ensure that that technology also becomes cheap, affordable to people. So that we have first the, the presence of the technology and then the other one is affordability so that uh, people cannot be able to have uh, it as a as a way that they can if they have money they access if they don't have money they leave they, they leave it alone so that it must be also made uh, affordable so that people can be able to access freely okay that's good now um for education never mind i i i, I am an uh uh, I'm passionate about policies yes. because policies are the foundational uh, are, are the foundational tool for transformation in any setting. So, um, especially uh, as we were the education set, setting. So now I wanted to ask uh, a question: How do you see accessibility being promoted with a public-private partnership? Because we're talking about technology right now, and perhaps the government does not have enough funds to be able to buy uh, laptops for every student in public school, for instance. So, but what do you see, uh, and how could that be an uh, a statement in the policies going forward? Yeah, thank you very much, John. Uh, I think what we need to do is to ensure that uh, we have various forms of technology, the high end. The medium. So, how can we be able to get a technology apply, a technology platform which we can be able to access affordably? So that is that is the, the key question. So that we have technology which is efficient, but at the same time also affordable. Yeah, I, and that was why I was talking about for affordability. That uh, do you think? Uh, sorry, there's an echo I'm hearing in background. Now, do you see uh, it as uh, something that the government can collaborate with the private sector to make those things more affordable? Yeah, yeah we, we, we require a lot of collaboration so that um, it, it, it becomes partially by governments. Uh, governments which are able to afford can, be, can go ahead and do that. In, an, in case where we have governments which are unable to do that, we require a lot of collaboration from uh, the, the, the other providers. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Langa, Mr. Paul Langa. Uh, yeah, uh, we appreciate the fact that you have been able to do a great uh, formal preparation to uh, present uh, in this conference. We appreciate the fact that uh, you you turn up and you have been able to do this massively. Uh, we we appreciate you for coming on 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 the platform, and then we we'll believe that uh, more people will be able to kind of like look through the system that you discussed about how um, education needs to be uh, education policies needs to be rethinked. So um, your presentation. Uh, um, would you be willing to make it available for uh, participants to have access to? I'll do so. I'll definitely do so. All right, no problem. So, because now you made mention of some very good questions that that needs to be looked at critically. You know, perhaps mm -hmm. the, the time is not so much for it to be really uh, talked about, but mm -hmm. those questions are going to be really, very, really, very important. So, thank you once again, Mr. Paul. We really appreciate you. Thank you very much. Yeah, so have a nice, nice day.
So everybody, um, yeah, that's uh, Mr. Langa that we just had, and um, he's from Kenya, and he has just talked about uh, he, he has talked about um, education policies. Policies are very, very important if you want to even think of mainstreaming education now or post COVID. Uh, so many things are, are, are surely in place. And it's important that uh, we start to look through a uh, peer-to-peer, as I will borrow from Dr. Shamal Majumda's uh, keynote uh, a little while ago, that we need to operate in, uh, in, a, uh, in a team, in an integrated format, to be able to like get solutions to the education system. So thank you very much for coming to this session. Yeah, make sure that you look through teachertonnetwork.com slash P for the update of uh, the presentation. Or you just go to our, our Facebook uh, page, teachertonnet Facebook page, uh, Twitter, Facebook page, uh, um, or YouTube, like I mean, YouTube, to be able to like follow the latest uh, uh, series that we are having. So we are just about getting into the middle of the thing, now it's getting really much more interesting. And we really appreciate everyone that was actually presented, and the presentations are really coming up to life right now. So thank you very much. See you on the other side of this.